It's episode 111 of the Keto for Women show. You're listening to the Keto for Women show. This podcast provides the tools you need to create your own expression of a healthy ketogenic lifestyle so you can stop obsessing and start living. I'm your host and nutritionist, Sean Miner. Now let's get on with the show. Let me take just a quick second here to tell you about another great offer coming from our friends over at ButcherBox. You all know by now that the quality of your meat matters so, so much to the health of your body, to your family's body, to your future health, the health and happiness of the animal you are consuming equals the health and happiness of your own body. That's really the simplest, easiest way to think about it. So you always want to make sure you can get the best quality meat for you and your family that you can afford. Butcher Box is the go-to source for the highest quality, best tasting meat sourced from these happy and healthy animals. And they've made it very affordable in order for you to get these meats delivered right to your door every single month. So you don't have to worry about sifting through the grocery store trying to find those meats that actually fit the bill. Because I can tell you from experience, it is becoming harder and harder to find these 100% grass fed, grass finished beef, the pasture raised chicken, the heritage breed pork. You just can't find that in grocery stores these days. You can get this all at ButcherBox because they are doing it right and sending it to your door so you don't have to worry about it. The summer promotion from ButcherBox is out. For the month of July, they are offering new members burgers all summer. That means if you sign up today, you get a free package of six burgers in every single box you get through October 15th. So you'll have fresh burgers with this awesome, amazing grass-fed, grass-finished beef all summer long, which I love burgers in the summer. What else would you possibly want to eat? It's the perfect time to grill those up. So head to butcherbox.com slash KFW to get your free burgers all summer. That's six free patties in every single box through the entire summer up until October 15th. Butcherbox.com slash KFW. Hey, hey, friends. Welcome back. Thanks as always for joining me on this episode of Keto for Women. Today, we have a very special guest we're going to chat with about a topic that, as you all know by now, is very near and dear to my heart. And as I mentioned, we are now going to talk more about what happens beyond the diet and especially when our diets don't work or we don't ever have success when we try to diet. We need to look beyond the food and see what else is going on. And this means I want to talk to more people who have had experience where they can change their life, their body, their weight, everything they want by looking internally at the mindset aspect of this whole thing we're trying to do here with our life, especially when, as most of us do, there are stories built in to our belief system and how do we get over those and understand those and see them for what they're worth so that we can move forward. And this is why I wanted to have Elizabeth on the show because she has done that. She had a great success after many, many, many years of major struggle and is now actually teaching this as her career. This is her job. So I really want to get into this episode right away. So let's do this. 
Elizabeth Benton was depressed, deeply in debt, and obese. As a nutrition expert and educator who binged on junk food every time she put gas in her car, she felt like a fraud and a failure. Desperate to start truly living her life, she decided to believe in her potential rather than her past. She lost 150 pounds, paid off $130,000 in debt, and remained debt-free as a successful entrepreneur. Today, Elizabeth is the owner of Primal Potential. Through her platform of podcasts, coaching, and live events, she has fueled her deepest struggles into a burning passion to help people create transformations and live more fulfilled lives. All right. I can't wait for you to hear this from Elizabeth. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining me on Keto for Women today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I am really excited for us to just kind of have this really nice, natural conversation because we, I can already tell, have a lot in common. So I'm really excited to get going. I think the main thing that I really want to dive into so deeply with you is your story, where you came from and all the stuff that you've been through and what you learned along the way, which is why you're doing what you're doing now and teaching what you teach. So let's get started with that. First, just give a little bit of an introduction and a little bit of a behind the scenes look at Elizabeth. Absolutely. So I live in New England. I am the host of the Primal Potential podcast, and I have been a business owner for the last five years, but I didn't come to where I'm at now with my focus on mindset and my focus on health. I didn't come to it naturally. I wasn't one of those like health nuts growing up that just thought it would be really fun. I was obese for most of my life. Like out of the womb, an obese baby on the growth charts. And it just got worse as I got older. And the most interesting to me thing is that I became more and more and more obsessed with food and with weight loss simultaneously as I got bigger. So the short version of this story is that my mom was very ill when she was pregnant with me. And so all logic said that I would be a very sickly, malnourished baby. Mm -hmm. But I was a heifer and a half. (laughs) Like (laughs) I was just a big chunker to survive, you know? Mm -hmm. So my metabolism adapted in utero to really get the most of whatever fuel that I got, which later in life felt really frustrating and like a major disadvantage. But while it started just being overweight, then all the mental and emotional stuff got into it. And that's where things got really tricky and the problems compounded because while growing up, everybody in my family really wanted me to lose weight because of course you're an overweight kid. They want you to be healthy, all of that. And so I got this association with food being bad, weight loss being good. I wanted to rebel. Food was so tightly controlled that when I could get it in a way that wasn't controlled, oh, watch out you know? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I hated being overweight and I didn't have friends and people picked on me and it just was really tough. But a lot of that negative emotion had me turning to the one thing that consistently brought me pleasure, which was food. So as I was in college and even after college, there seemed to be this really intense battle in my life between food is my escape. It's how I numb myself out. And also I hate this, get me out of here. I'll do anything, but not really. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, you know, I'll say I'll do anything and then I'll go, you know, get cupcakes from the gas station and eat hostess cupcakes until I feel sick. And I tried every diet under the sun. And I felt like something was wrong with me and my body was broken. And I even walked away from my degree program in Latin and Greek to study nutrition because I thought if I can just study nutrition, then I'll figure it all out. And that was one of many moments where I realized it wasn't about what I knew. I knew what to do. I just wasn't doing it. And that's what really set me on fire for changing my own mind and now helping other people change their minds. Because what I realized is Change isn't something that happens from the outside in. I go on this diet, this external thing, and then I'm changed, or I follow this plan, and then I am changed. It really has to begin 
with changing the way you think and changing your mindset. And when you do that, you just remove all the barriers. And that's really what was true for me with my body, with my relationship with food, with my weight, with my finances. And now that's what I love helping other people change in their lives. Oh, it's so true. I love that all of that so much. And I think going through your story, pretty much everyone had at least a little bit that they could relate to, right? Like the dieting and, you know, you know what to do, but then actually doing it might not be as easy as it looks. Mm -hmm. What I want to go back to is almost like probably childhood, adolescent, teenage years where you are getting all this external information. Mm -hmm. And now I think now, you know, that that really drove how you behaved. But back then, what did that feel like? What did that look like for you to be hearing all this stuff from your family, your friends getting bullied? How do you think that contributed to where you are now? At the time, the message to me was, you're not good enough because you're overweight, but if you're not overweight, you'll be good enough, mm-hmm. right? Like you're so smart. If only you could lose this weight. You're so talented. If only you could lose weight. So the message to me was the weight is the problem. You're not okay until you lose weight. And it also, that message led me to feel a lot of shame, a shame of whatever I ate, a shame, you know, about the way that I looked, the way that my clothes fit or didn't fit, all of that stuff. There was just so much shame. Mm-hmm. And as to how it impacts me now, fortunately, I think I had to unlearn a lot of these associations with weight and with food. Now, what that doesn't mean though, it doesn't mean that I went to like the other side and it was, you know, you're perfect however you are, because Mm -hmm. the fact is it wasn't about my size at all. It's not, you're good enough if you're thin, you're good enough if you're big. It's not about the size at all. It's not about body love or body shame. What it is is about happiness. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't happy when I was hiding behind food. I wasn't happy when I was escaping to food. I wasn't happy when I was overweight, but here's the other piece of it. After I lost the first 100 pounds, I still wasn't happy. Of course. So, right. So, you know, it wasn't about weight at all. And that's, I guess, what goes back to my core thesis of my own life now is it has to come from the inside out and not from the outside in. So how many times did you lose and gain and lose again trying to find that happiness? Oh my gosh. I don't know. However many times possibly you can fit into a couple decades. Like every week repeat, right? It was right. literally whether it was two great days, six bad days, or two great months, six bad months, or six great months, two bad. It, it was just endless. It was endless from when I was probably seven or eight years old until my early 30s. And then did that feed into it just basically you feeling worse and worse and worse about yourself? Yeah, because there was this pattern of either I'm doing good, so I am good, or I'm doing bad, so I am bad, totally missing the fact that like I was unhappy either way, right? I was unhappy when I was on some super strict diet Mm -hmm. because my mind wasn't right. And I was unhappy when I was eating everything because my mind wasn't right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The work was never actually done. Right. Right. Now let's go to that spot then where you're probably at rock bottom to some degree, I would imagine maybe in more aspects of your life than just your body and your relationship to food, but you're just really digging at the very bottom. And did something kind of magically change? Was it this kind of like aha moment or what did it look like? Well, I was grasping at straws to address my unhappiness because I was in my early thirties, late twenties, early thirties. I had a good job. I was making good money. I was married. We bought a new house and I hated my life. You know, (laughs) like I was just so deeply unhappy. I didn't want to make friends or have friends or see people or be with my family because I was so ashamed of myself. But I was always searching for like, well, if I change this, then I'll be happy. And, and the thing du jour was, well, if I get out of debt, 
Mm. then I'll be happy. And then I'll be able to focus on me, you know, which totally I could have done both at the same time, but this is the story (laughs) I told myself then. And so I got this like hearts on fire passion to pay off all of our debt. I was married at the time. I'm not anymore, but you know, credit cards, student loans, all of that stuff, just get out of debt. And I did, and it was hard and it took discipline and it took consistency and things went wrong every week. Unexpected expenses came up and different things like that, but I kept going and we got it done. And I also was having a lot of success in my job. I was good at my job. I got promoted a handful of times in a short period of time. People saw me as a leader in my role and I, and I knew I was good at it. And at the same time, I was super overweight. I was over 350 pounds and I just wasn't happy. And I told myself the reason I was overweight was because I just wasn't motivated because I just wasn't disciplined. And at some point, I don't know what triggered this. I thought, Mm -hmm. but I am, (laughs) I am disciplined and I am motivated because I get to work before everybody else. Nobody makes me do that. I come in on the weekends. Nobody makes me do that. I paid down $130,000 of debt in less than two years. Nobody made me do that. So why is it that I can be disciplined and motivated in these two areas that honestly did not matter as much to me as how I felt about myself and my health and my body? So if I'm sitting here saying the thing I want most is to lose weight, then why am I not putting that discipline and that effort and that consistency in, in that area? And Asking that question and really looking at the answer was a big shift for me. Because you realized up until then you had been kind of only focusing on the outside, not the internal factors. I don't even think I knew that yet. But what it made me realize was that if I told myself, I suck at my job, nobody trusts me, I'm lazy, I'm this, I'm that, then all of those things would have been true. If I told myself, I'll never get out of debt, what's the point? We don't make enough or there's too much debt, why bother, live a little. If I had told those stories, I wouldn't have created those results. But I didn't tell those stories. In fact, when it came to getting out of debt, initially my former husband wasn't on board with it. And I was like, we're doing it anyway. You're going to be glad. It's going to be worth it. It's going to be the best thing we ever did. And same thing with work. Like, I want to be proud of myself. I want people to respect me. I want to be good at my job. I want to feel like I'm contributing something. But with my weight, it was, I can't. Mm. Something's wrong with me. And I thought, if I was telling these awful stories about failure and setback and barriers and reasons I couldn't in my finances or my job, I would never be good at them. But here I am wondering why I'm struggling with this other area And I I just realized that it began with, and the most important factor was what I believed to be true about it. Mm -hmm. So you could really start kind of thinking more about the stories you had around this whole situation. Absolutely. And the thing is, you know, a lot of people will say to me, but you had been terrible at losing weight. You had been unable to lose weight. Yeah. But I had also accumulated a lot of debt. I also had sucked at my job before the one I was good at. And I would go home for lunch and take a two hour nap, but I was not stuck in those choices. I was free to make a change. And I did. But if I told myself the same story of why bother, you're no good at this, you're not smart, nobody trusts you, I wouldn't have. And when I could see that clear as day with my finances and my work, I was like, well, looky here at a big, huge piece of the puzzle I hadn't yet explored. Oh, so good. It's so true. So then that really marked a change for you. And how did you progress from there? The first change... I laugh in retrospect because it's such a stark contrast to where I am now. And I'm so proud of that and grateful for that. And I think we should all feel pride more frequently and, Mm -hmm. and without shame, like be proud of yourself, celebrate the little wins. But I started ordering less at Chick-fil-A for breakfast. So I had a routine. (laughs) I swear to God, I had a routine where I would drive out of my way, like several, probably 15 minutes out of my way to go to Chick-fil-A on the way to work. And I would get a chicken biscuit 
and chicken minis and hash browns and a large Diet Coke. And the first thing I did was, you know what? What I am able and willing to do, because before that, remember, it was all, all or nothing. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I'm counting calories and I'm only eating 1,200 calories a day or I'm cutting out this whole food group or whatever. And I just said to myself, okay, <laughs> you know, when we were getting out of debt, we didn't like sell our house and our cars. We, we started with, with something that felt reasonable and comfortable. And I've never done that before with food. So I said, I'm either going to get for breakfast, the chicken minis or the chicken biscuit and hash browns and a large diet Coke, but not the chicken minis and the chicken biscuit. And if I couldn't decide one morning, I'd be like, okay, well, tomorrow we'll have the other one, which is it today. There were certainly mornings I still wanted both, but it was just, look, it's not going anywhere. And you know what? If you want to have some for lunch, come back. Mm -hmm. For breakfast, it was just... I'm basically cutting a third out of my breakfast by getting chicken biscuit or chicken minis, but not both. It was literally that small, but it was such a marked shift from the way I had approached it before. And it's something that at that point you knew you could do. Exactly. It didn't intimidate me, even though it wasn't always effortless, right? There were still days where I was like, who cares? I want both. I'm really hungry. It doesn't matter. I'll do better later. It was just this one simple commitment. Oh, I love that so much. That is something I think a lot of people can relate to is just when you are, especially with diet, it's like, for some reason, we all think it has to be 100% in or completely out, but it doesn't have to be that way. And in fact, that is a lot more doable and a lot more sustainable to make yeah. these little mini changes, no matter where you're starting, even if it is, you know, it's not like I can't ever go to Chick-fil-A again, because that's not going to happen. Like you're going to go to Chick-fil-A again. Right. Before we move on, I have yet another awesome brand to introduce you to that has a mission of creating natural, toxin-free, clean products for your life, and that is Native. Native creates safe, simple, effective products that people use in their bathroom every day, like deodorant, toothpaste, bar soap, and body wash. They use trusted ingredients that actually work. Their products are formulated without aluminum, parabens, and talc. They're filled with ingredients found in nature, such as coconut oil, which is antimicrobial, shea butter for moisturizer and emollient, and tapioca starch, which absorbs wetness. There is no animal testing on any of their products either. People love Native. With over 8,000 five-star reviews, Native has been featured in places like the Today Show, Women's Health, Elle Magazine, Good Morning America, Pop Sugar, Nylon, Hello Giggles, and more. Something we all love to see, less is more with Native. They have fewer, simpler ingredients, which is so important to all of us Keto for Women listeners now, so you know every single thing that's going into the product that you're using every single day in your bathroom. They also have great scents. Native comes in a wide variety of enticing scents like coconut, vanilla, lavender, rose, and cucumber mint. And they even release limited edition seasonal scents throughout the year. That sounds super fun to me. I want to be a part of that. They've also made sure to include unscented formulas and baking soda-free formulas for those with specific sensitivities. I've had the pleasure of adding Native products to my life for a little bit now, and I'm really loving them. I chose the lavender rose scent. Smells amazing, not too strong, which is really important to me. It's just a hint of this amazing lavender rose scent all day long. It's great. I've really put it to the test going to the gym and getting sweaty or having these long summer hikes. I leave feeling fresh, which is my big clue that they are actually working and will be effective. So that means they're clean and they're effective, which is so important for us to find. We've spent a lot of time lately talking about detoxifying our lives and products. I'm committed to bringing you trustworthy brands that make it easy for you to make this switch because I know it can be hard. Native is one of those brands I can fully get behind. And for Keto for Women listeners right now, they are giving you 20% off your first purchase when you visit nativedeodorant.com and use promo code KETO, the number four women during checkout. That's 20% off your first purchase over at Native. Going to nativedeodorant.com and use that promo code KETO, the number four women And a big thanks to them for supporting this podcast and helping bring this episode to air. 
So instead, just making these small little changes that eventually then add up. I'm assuming yeah. as you moved forward, you started making other little shifts. Oh, absolutely. L- little things like if I wanted something that I would consider an indulgence, typically it would be like, oh, well, if I'm going to have this, then I might as well have it all. Cause the story I told myself was, but tomorrow I'm going to be on point. Although mm-hmm. that was never true. And it was just this story that I told myself it was the hall pass that I gave myself to proceed. What I would do is I would just write it down in the notes app of my phone. So like somebody brings in donuts in the, and I would just write down donuts. And it wasn't, no, you can't have donuts. Donuts are bad. You're bad. It was just donuts would be good. So that when I decided I wanted to indulge and it was worth it, I was almost like I was acknowledging it. Like, Mm -hmm. yep. Instead of trying to shove it down, push it away, internal battle, just, yep. Okay. Acknowledged. You want a donut. We can revisit that. So I wasn't saying no, shutting it down, fighting with willpower and deprivation. And I just wouldn't have it right then at that moment. And oftentimes I did then have it three hours later, but just putting that pause in place, Mm -hmm. instead of going so quickly from impulse to action, I just, I didn't even know what I was doing at the time. It wasn't really that thought out or deliberate, which hopefully gives encouragement to people who were like, I don't know what I'm doing. I didn't either. I had failed so much. I was just trying to do things differently, Mm -hmm. right? Because we can't do things the way we've always done them and expect to get a different result. And I just started to write it down and not say yes in that moment. Because there's sometimes would be this like panicked urge to get it right away, whatever it was like, fear of missing out, which I'm sure goes back to my childhood and my mom really restricting what I ate. So if I had the opportunity to get the cookie, I better get the cookie before she took the cookies and threw them away, you know? Right, right. But it it was this sense of like urgency and panic that led to a lot of compulsion with food. And I started to take the drama away. Like, yeah, sour watermelons sound really good. But right now I'm just going to write it down. I'm going to come back to it later. And that was just yet another of many small shifts that really helped. I can already see that what you're building is mindfulness. Yeah. Yeah. You're just spending a little bit more time acknowledging your feelings, your thoughts, your actions, instead of this impulse that I think a lot of people have impulsive nature around food, right? Because most likely because of these stories and being restricted and feeling like you can't and you shouldn't and you're a terrible person if you do, then it makes us want it that much more. And so all you're doing right now is building this mindfulness around your food choices, which is the best place to start. And a lot of the compulsion too was fueled by being disengaged, right? So very much not mindful, but also not being willing to look at it. You know, for example, I would often not turn the lights on in the bathroom because I didn't want to see myself. Mm. And I had the same approach with food. I didn't want to think about how much I was eating or what I was eating because I didn't want to acknowledge or face the judgment that coming from within or the shame. And so things would go really quickly because I didn't want to like look at it. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? And so it would just be checked out, zoned out, not even engaged in life at all, not paying attention, not owning it. And just starting to slow down a little bit to say, okay, you can have that. But let's not get in this cycle where it's and you're not even really there. I wasn't enjoying the food when I was overeating most of the time because I was checked out, zoned out, numbed out, not paying attention. I wanted to enjoy food more and feel better. Yeah. So then it's just a matter of putting it in your iPhone so it's there. And if it's something that sounds really good, then you can have it. Yeah. And you know, that didn't continue on that way forever because at one point it was an improvement. And this is where I see Mm -hmm. a lot of people get kind of stuck in a trap. What was once an improvement, you then continue to tell yourself remains an improvement. Why isn't this working anymore? It's so much better than I used to do. But the fact is the improvements from three, four, five, six years ago are not improvements for me now. And we always have to be adjusting and adapting. So at that time, 
for me to pick two or three of the seven things I wanted to indulge in in a day was a massive improvement. Nowadays, I'd gain 20 pounds Mm -hmm. or more. Mm -hmm. So always kind of looking at, is this really an improvement? You know, can I make today better than yesterday versus I'm patting myself on the back that today is better than five years ago. Like, it's time to raise the bar. So then how did that as you, this was the start, but Mm -hmm. then it progressed and did you start seeing improvements in how you felt and things like that? And that sparked you to continue on or how did this change continue to happen? I, like, I think most people really wanted to be healthy. You know, it wasn't just, I want to lose weight. It wasn't just, I want to eat less sugar. I really, really wanted to be healthy And so even as I started to eat less fast food and less sugar, it wasn't just how much can I get away with and still lose weight. I wanted to be well and vibrant. So I started playing around more with whole foods, but trying to do it in a way that it didn't feel extreme, that it didn't feel untenable, that it didn't feel like the all or nothing approaches because I don't feel good when I'm eating sugar on a regular basis. And I wanted to be thinner for sure, but healthier also. So I just made small steps in that direction. So you knew that that would be the path to wellness for you beyond just looking at the food and how much you were eating and and making more mindful choices. You now had this alternate idea and mm-hmm. goal, I guess, built into this was that you you did want to get as healthy as you could as well. So then you have like more of a driving force. Absolutely. There's more behind these changes now. Yeah. A hundred percent. Oh, I love it. That's so great. And then now, so what's the end result now? How, when was this and how many years out are we? And and what does your life look like now? So we're probably about five and a half, six years out And it changes every day, right? The bar raises every day, every week, every year. But also, you know, when I started, my desire was to be as not fat as possible. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I never thought of my, like, I want to be skinny. I didn't, I didn't really think about that so much. I just didn't want to be so fat. And then over time, it was kind of like, where's my sweet spot? where I feel really good in my body and I'm healthy and I'm really enjoying food. The three best things in the world. Right. All at once. (laughs) But the thing that I've found and I'm always learning is that that is always changing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, so sometimes I'm carrying a little more weight and sometimes I'm carrying a little less weight and I'm still finding out where I feel best. And I believe I always will be. Absolutely. It's a never ending. It's not a, it's not a battle. It's not a struggle. It's nothing like that. It's just this information. It's just relationship. Yeah. It's like, you know, in a romantic relationship, there are periods where you're like more the passion and the chemistry. And then there's periods that are more like gentle and about Mm -hmm. communication. And then there are periods where it's just damn hard. Yeah. And it's Absolutely. very much it's very much the same with food and things like that. Absolutely. That is such a good analogy. It really is true. And and it's never done. It's never perfect and it's never done. You're always learning and growing and changing. And that's where you're at now. But it feels like you just have learned so much along the way, like you have mentioned several times about healing from the inside out and learning more about yourself from the inside out. When was it that you realized all these stories that you had about yourself and your weight and your worth? And what did you do to get out of that? I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, just a few weeks ago, I was interviewing somebody for my podcast and they helped me see a story. I didn't even know that like my weight was how I got attention. Mm -hmm. Losing weight was how I got attention. Gaining weight was how I got attention. And and I had never thought of it that way before. And then when you look at my work now, and when Primal Potential first started, it was very much about my weight loss. And now it's really not. And I think that's reflective of the fact that that's not how I need to get attention anymore. Mm -hmm. And I had never seen that. So the, the first answer is I'm still 
learning stories in every area of my life about fears around money and lack and scarcity, about food and weight and attention and shame and acceptance and all of that always. But how I changed them was just not feeding the drama. Like the past is very real. And when we change our story, we're not denying that things happened. But what we're saying is I can be different today. It is true that I ate in response to emotion for most of my life and that there will be moments when I do moving forward. But today I can choose Food only when I'm hungry. Like food can be the solution exclusively to hunger today. That's it. Mm -hmm. And that's that's an ever going practice in every story. So maybe it's that I am defensive in my romantic relationship. That can be true of the past. And yet today I can choose to show up differently. I don't have to be defensive today, but I struggle to break free from that if I keep saying, I'm just really defensive. I'm just really defensive. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that is a forever practice. In every aspect of life, not just food, obviously. Absolutely. Yeah. And what other things do you do, you know, besides looking at the food you're putting on your plate and and thinking about your past stories and and that kind of thing? What other things do you do in terms of self-care, self-love, anything like that, that you have made part of your everyday life to, you know, help you feel a little bit better about yourself? Since it seems like you've had a past of not thinking you were that great of a person because of these stories. Yeah. I am a big believer in journaling, but I'm not somebody who sits down for like 20, 25 minutes and writes about my feelings. I'm like an efficient (laughs) journaler with a purpose. So I start my day identifying how I want to feel today. So I I have a mantra with my clients that is the goal is the feeling. Mm. And even when I wanted to lose 100 pounds or 150 pounds or get out of debt or whatever it was... It was because I thought I would feel a certain way when I got there. That's why I wanted it, right? Whether it was confidence or peaceful or, you know, whatever. So every day I ask myself, how do I want to feel today? And the answer is different every single day. But then I say, what do I need to do? And what do I need to not do to make sure that I feel that way? So sometimes it's related to food. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a lot of different things. Today, for example, we're recording this on a Monday. And I had a huge party at my house last night and people stayed over and there's a ton of food everywhere. And I have a very full work day. So today I want to feel amazing in my body and I want to feel really calm in my work. Mm -hmm. So what do I need to do or not do to feel that way? Well, I don't need to eat the leftover cookies and brownies and cakes and cupcakes and all of that. I took a minute this morning to write out, I'm going to have some of the leftover veggies this morning. I'm going to have leftover cauliflower rice this afternoon. I'm going to grill some burgers and make a big salad for dinner, but I'm staying away from the chips, the crackers, the cookies, whatever, because I want to feel really good in my body today. Cause you know, I woke up this morning, not feeling super great in my body. Mm -hmm. And then as far as calm, I need to be where my feet are. I don't need to be having this conversation thinking about what happens next. I don't need to be telling myself, oh my God, there's not enough time. Oh my God, 402 emails. No, Mm -hmm. I need to be in the moment I'm in. So if I'm responding to an email, I'm responding to an email. If I'm recording a podcast, I'm recording a podcast. And so that is my biggest thing that I do every day. And then I also meditate. I try to drink a lot of water and I really try to honor my body with regards to sleep. Yes. Huge. Yeah. Like one of the biggest things I think besides maybe diet, I think sleep is next. Uh, Yeah. So then now you, you work with clients about this whole topic, everything we've talked about today. My question to you is, do you ever see people who need to lose weight in order to be healthy? Do you ever see that happen without them doing this internal work first? Yeah. But then they won't sustain it. Yes. So it's not a lifestyle. It's not something that they can keep around. Right. Because, you know, we can follow a plan for a little bit, but then maybe we go on vacation and that's the catalyst or whatever, whatever, like something Mm -hmm. get to a stressful period of work or the holiday season comes or the kids are out of school or whatnot. And if you don't change the way you think, 
then you will continue to stumble at the same excuses, the same setbacks, the same barriers that you always did before. And so, yeah, me, like anybody else, we can get short-term results with short-term strategies, but that's a crappy way to live because you keep doing all of this work only to do it again. Mm -hmm. Never ending cycle. Yeah. And there's still so much that you is just untapped within your body that's going to fester and it's going to eventually show its face. You know, these stories, yeah. these emotions, these feelings, things that you haven't explored yet that if until you explore them, you're up against this wall that's going to win. Yep. It's going to be the reason Absolutely. why you black out and start eating all the donuts or, you know, make the, like you were saying, you don't even, you weren't even thinking when you would shove the cookies in your mouth before, you know, right. before they were gone because right. you had this whole sense of scarcity. And you had a lot of emotions about yourself and how it related to your weight. So you really have to do that work. So what is, you mentioned journaling and meditating. Like what is the very, very first thing that anybody can do right now? A very simple thing to start even just acknowledging what's really going on in their head as it relates to their body and their weight. I think it is journaling. Okay. I have these four pillars that I work with my clients on. And the first and the most important one is awareness. Because if you're not aware of how you're thinking when you make that choice, if you're not aware of how you're feeling when you make that choice, if you're not aware of this excuse that in the moment feels very real and valid, then you can't make sustainable change. You'll be in that a thousand beginnings with no end in sight cycle So I do believe it begins with awareness. And I think the easiest way to start to build that awareness muscle is journaling. I would agree with you. And it doesn't have to be fluffy, flowery, pretty journaling. It can be all the bad stuff. It's just writing. It's just free writing, you know, whatever comes to mind, whatever your thoughts are, whatever your feelings are. And eventually it gets somewhere. It may not even seem like it makes sense now, Yeah, but you can really get somewhere. And I just think putting it into words is just so beneficial. And you begin to start to say, oh, that's crap. But when it's just in your head, there's not enough time to question it before you move on to the next thought. But writing it slows you down enough to start to see it in a new way. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. And so you have, this is now your career. This is what you do. And you have even written a book, correct? That is correct. Tell us about that. I wrote a book called Chasing Cupcakes, which people always are like, why in the world did you name it Chasing Cupcakes? But I I think it's adorable. (laughs) Thank you. I wanted to write a book about creating change the lasting way, about breaking down the barriers that hold you back, because typically we just think it's the path, right? It's the plans problem. And so we jump to another plan and then another plan, and this one didn't work for me and that one didn't work for me. But what it is is that the same barriers are on every single plan and you're just running into them at different times. And so we have to remove those barriers because there's more than one way to skin a cat, right? Like Mm -hmm. there's more than one way to get healthy, to lose weight, to get out of debt, to launch a business, any of that. But none of them will work if you have these barriers in place. And so I was really struggling with like what to name this book about creating change in your life and thinking differently, really, really, truly thinking differently. And one of my friends said to me, go with your gut. And in a self-deprecating kind of humor way, I said, well, if I really was going to go with my gut, I'd call it chasing cupcakes, right? Because hostess (laughs) cupcakes from the gas station were like the things that I would eat a lot of. And the picture on the cover of the book is this beautiful cupcake. And instead of a candle, there's a stick of dynamite in it. Because this thing that I was chasing so sure that it was the thing I wanted. Like, I just want to have the donut. Like it's been a stressful day. I just want Mexican food. Mm -hmm. It had blown up in my face and it really wasn't the thing I wanted most. So that's really the heart of the book. Well, that's adorable. That's super cute. And that's available on Amazon, correct? Yep. Cool. I love it. And then tell us a little bit more about your business and what you do there. Primarily, I'm a podcaster and a coach. I have a show called Primal Potential, and we've got 650 or so episodes. That's, I don't know how that is possible. That seems like 
<laughs> That's amazing. Good for you. Thank you. It's a lot of fun. I really love it. When the show started, it was a lot about nutrition. And now it's really about change. And it's not about food. It's not about weight loss, but it's about how to effectively create change in your life. And so I work with clients in, in like my 12 weeks to transformation on how to do that. But really my passion is helping people get out of their own way so they can set themselves free. Mm -hmm. That's so great. And you do that one-on-one with people? No, I do it in groups. I don't do a lot of one-on-one anymore, but yeah, we've got, we've got groups that usually run about three times a year. That's amazing. That sounds like just what I think most people need for sure is how to create that actual change. And everyone, we're all at least to some degree in our own way. We're getting in our own way every day. Yep. So that's really important. Such good work. And then one final question for you. If someone listening is thinking, I tried keto. It doesn't work for me. It never works. It didn't work. I don't know what to do. Do I keto harder? Do I quit? This is what I actually get on a daily basis. So I just want you to know, these are actual people. Yeah. They just don't know what went wrong with keto when it worked for everybody else. What is your advice? The first thing I would say is start writing everything down every day for two weeks if you aren't already. Because oftentimes what happens is that the inconsistencies that we sort of brushed over is like just this little thing, you know, but when we see it on paper, we're like, well, (laughs) maybe I was more inconsistent than I was consistent. Seeing the power of it on paper is really powerful, but not just like the inconsistency, especially with keto. One of the things I have my clients track is hunger. Maybe you're doing all the things right in terms of food choices, but you're just giving yourself license to eat cheese because it's keto, even though you're not hungry, when the fact is, if you give your body more fuel than it needs, the excess has to be stored. It doesn't matter if it's heavy whipping cream and stevia or it's a Twinkie, Mm -hmm. you know? So I would really start with journaling. And then the other thing I would say is don't spend so much time arguing for all you're doing right. If it's not working, just make a change. Mm, yeah, that's so true. If what you're currently doing isn't working, then it's not right for you. Exactly. And it doesn't matter if it's right for somebody else or if it worked for you five years ago. Let's deal with reality and not argue with reality because we lose our power, we lose our momentum, we lose our energy when we argue with reality. Ah, so true. And all you have to do is make a simple change, make a few simple changes to find where you feel best. And that's, that's what right. I talk about all the time, but it is hard. It's hard for people that don't feel like they have any control around food or anything like that. So I think doing this initial work, this internal work, which starts with just simply writing things down, write down whatever is coming into your head will be the first step and could make some big, big changes with just a simple exercise. And there's a difference between not having control and not taking control. So anybody who tells themselves that they don't have control isn't being honest. You do have control, but you're not taking it. If I said to you, I'll give you a million dollars next Friday, if you were consistent between now and then, it would be the easiest week of your life. You'd be like, is this a joke? (laughs) Nothing changed. Nothing changed about your potential. The only thing that changed was your perspective. Mm, That is so true. So true. Elizabeth, thank you so much. Just remind everyone one more time where they can find you, your Instagram, your social media, all that. We know about your podcast, your website, all that good stuff. Absolutely. Primalpotential.com. That'll take you to the podcast. Uh, That'll take you to my social media. I'm at Elizabeth Benton on Instagram, but I'd love to connect with you. I, I love people. I love helping people set themselves free. I'm really, really excited. Yay. That's awesome. Thank you so, so much for sharing your story, for being so open. I think everyone can take a snippet from that for sure. And really think about how that can apply to their own life. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. 